and I will share my screen so that we all follow this. And every time it's we try to refine the process here, we make the road by walking is the idea. And it's a learning environment, essentially where I would say one of the missing pieces of the whole project is that always make, always make the road by walking. We're on the cutting edge of collaborative development and open hardware. And um, as such, it's up to all of us to teach each other. And it's like we're forming a tribe where we are teaching each other all the different different skills. And I definitely see that's a weakness in the sense that sometimes there's a lot of confusion, not enough process. And yes, that's a recognized thing from the feedback form. So let me go back to... Uh, the document and follow an agenda. Um, so here we go. Uh, first of all, welcome to, so we start the meeting off with kind of reviewing where we are as the team. And first thing, first of all, is we kind of look at the numbers, how the team is doing in terms of po team population, team health. So first of all, welcome to Cassie and Israel, uh, two new players on the team. So we're up to about um, actually 15 people. Uh, altogether, our acceptance rate so far has been 30 percent. About so you're the chosen. Uh, it's not so easy to pass the free cut test. A lot of people have given up on that. But for those of you who haven't filled out the timesheet, you see in the bottom corner here, um, you see the big dip uh, for today's date. Uh, that means people haven't just simply haven't logged their time yet. Um, please do that. Uh, let me just capture that. Yeah, but as you see, the average time right now, um, we're at about like 15. It's 15 there. That means 150 hours per week of contributions from the dedicated development team moving forward on the official development process. Once again, it's working on the Global Village construction set, which is not just a bunch of individual tools, but a collection and kind of an operating system, kind of a kernel for hardware is an extremely hard proposition because we're, how do you draw the boundaries, how do you define everything clearly. But um, uh, please fill out your timesheet if you haven't done so. And as far as the process of the team, it's, so here, just, just uh, summarizing this graph here, we, we're tracking the number of contributors. So, so 10 is actually, even though we've got like 15 people, like 10 people or 13 or so people, uh, 10 people are actually people who have logged their time. So maybe there's a person or two that maybe had a bad week or something, didn't get to log. But the fact that 15, the actual number of hours is above, is above the number of contributors, that means that on average, if the red is above the blue, that means we're doing more than 10 hours per week on average, which is good. Uh, I know I certainly am. I mean, I do this full time, so I put in about 50 hours per week. That kind of brings up the average a little bit. But I think altogether, it seems that people are going above uh, the 10 hour per week, which is good. That's really good. Uh, team health is good here. And last week, I just uh, pointed out that our first developer has completed a full cycle, which is 120 hours. That means 12 weeks or 90 days at so 10 hours per week. So congratulations, Emmanuel. And then Jose is up close second there and the way it works is that one development cycle you you become an OSC developer and if you would like to continue in your reputation then you can become a process manager actually learning to run a team after which you qualify to form a team or a chapter and after a year of participation as soon as one year and that doesn't mean one year is what it would take it might take longer but a chapter would be established, collaborating on a critical path so we can get stuff done. And you can look at the OSC roadmap on the wiki for the overall pro um, progress. Okay, as far as uh, last week I posted a feedback questionnaire, please fill it out. Only three people have filled it out so far. Now you can look at the responses here on page three and just click on that. But based on the feedback so far, uh, as I mentioned, there's definitely a gap on a the documentation of best practices how you do stuff because we're we're working things out so we're currently at the language agnostic instructionals phase meaning really clear super clear instructionals on how to how to build stuff working on a 3d printer primarily right now uh, so I would say the the way we can address that is uh, I am trying to find some time to do the recruit more documenters 
uh, specifically for producing curriculum. So it's uh, it's still a developer, still would have to learn FreeCAD because we use FreeCAD as a central part. But from there, we would we would create all kinds of curriculum. So that person who's a curriculum creator, the educator, has to actually end up understanding the tool itself. So the way teaching works is that if you really want to learn something, the best way is to teach it. Because then you certainly have to understand and you have to present it. So it takes it takes learning something to a whole new level. And I would actually encourage you to think that way when you think about, oh, why am I learning this? Well, I'm not just learning it for myself. I'm going to teach others. And that's a big part of this collaborative literacy. We talk about working as a team. But... Uh, this week, so last week and this week, I'm, I'm focusing actually a lot on the utilities for the Seed Eco Home, which we built last year, because we have a build coming up in November, and we still have to install all of them. So I've been spending a bit of time on that and just a little bit of time on the 3D printer. But this after this week, I, I really aim to go full full time back into the 3D printer as the print cluster and, and refining the print quality, basically getting perfect prints out of our 3D printer so we can use start using them. And in fact, the goal is... I'm not going to be using the Lulzbot Mini, which I used last time because we didn't have the 3D printer to print parts. Now I want to use the the printer itself, the D3D, to print parts for the next workshop. So that means a print cluster and perfected prints. And to assist with that, we're also working on a filament maker to make 3D printing filament. But that's a big task. Now perfecting our design to the point that it's got reliable printing capacity. And I want to set up a cluster of about four to six of those printers which is what we'll need to print out parts in time if if we aim to scale up the workshop to 24 participants so that's the goal uh, that we'd like to have that means uh, 24 people participating at a fee that means a robust business model for doing that it means you can get people around get people to show up and pay you to run these workshops when they when they get a 3D printer to take home after a single day of build. So that's the extreme manufacturing in practice. Uh, very efficient builds for which we need good documentation, which is coming along. We did excellent on the exploded part animations last time. People gave us a standing ovation during the workshop uh, for the quality of those, and that's the people building that on the front page. But the next step is the language agnostic instructions. I'm actually quite encouraged. A little preview here. Look at this. Roberto's going at it with these excellent instructionals like this here. So uh, let me just return back to a little bit of the uh, the agenda here. So feedback form. Yes. If you haven't filled it out, please do so. We're a learning organization. We teach each other. If you don't provide feedback, we don't we don't know what we're doing right or wrong. That, that's important to do so. Only three people have done that. There's like 10 people that need to fill it out. The new people, you don't have to worry about it since you haven't seen enough of this process yet. Um, but if, you, if you're inspired, you can still fill out the feedback form if you have any pressing issues. Okay, um, next item is um, how do we do this process of documenting and developing better? So we have the Scrum stand up to report on the progress from last week. But let's try something different, actually. I was looking at... Uh, so first of all, I failed to post this document in time. I just posted this, this this agenda, which I promised I would do last Monday, which I didn't. Uh, by the way, we need I mean we need someone to actually do that as a process manager as we get more people on. Uh, but what if we kind of go back to the lazy way, which we already um, have to do, which is our logs? Okay, so. I don't know if it's possible, but we wanted to do this the Scrum stand up here so that people can go through their stuff pretty rapidly. But it's definitely redundant. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're not in this document, so let me just paste this document again for whoever's not watching uh, the doc inside the document. Please go into the document, and this document should be openly editable. Actually, let's see the permissions. We do everything on these docs open permissions for edit, and that's because the Google Docs. Have revision okay I need to go to advanced and make it that everyone can edit this uh, can view can edit this is our industry standard when you do link sharing share when you share documents save as anyone can edit done so that you can actually contribute to this document throughout but the idea is if someone messes up something in a document you have to worry about it because there's a revision history and we can go back to a, a former version uh, but let's try this on uh, team progress updates. We have the Scrum typically, and, and I didn't post this document. But 
I don't know, and, and this is up for debate. I mean, we can definitely try this document again next week for the quick report on what people have done. But the other way is to go go back to the kind of the rough way, opening up all the tabs for all the people's logs and, and going through that. So this is what I did. I put up all the tabs of all the different contributors. So if you want to find out who all the contributors are, um, go to, for example, d3d log which you should be familiar with from your welcome email uh, the d3d log if you go to that it has a link to everybody's uh, like here for this is I'm on the d3d log page there's a link to everybody's log so you can quickly review what everyone's doing and wait I guess we haven't added Israel or Cassie to this this team this log page but I did put that on, on top of my log but anyway I'm just gonna click through everybody's logs and kind of comment on things and see if after that like let's try this that simply we we leave through every person's log during the meeting and let's see how transparent the results are from that because um, one thing to do is instead of double posting to the work document yeah I mean we should have the links in the, in the work document so people can find it if they aren't familiar with people's logs but I would propose we do that a little differently. So in the there's a role allocation slide within each meeting, and that's slide number six. And so we basically say what everybody else, what everybody is doing, and what if we try that we simply hyperlink like the key work product uh, by every person's name. So I would say let's just try this, like just hyperlink your your main working document. And that main working document could simply be, say, your log. But in your log, try to make it transparent, like embed the Google Docs or embed pictures so that someone can see. And, and I guess let me just go through. So I'm going to kind of brief through these. I, I'm going to point out IO, for example, what he did. Let me see if we're... Okay, look at this, for example. So this is IO. Um, so this is what he's doing on Saturday May 6th look at what he's doing that's really cool embedded pictures in your log work really well he's got his badge and links to all the other logs here so that's a way to collaborate but this is a cool thing so instead of say um, like if you want to put a link in the D3D the, the dev team meeting role allocation that would be one effective way to do it just simply yeah I mean let, let's try this just try to link to your key number one product within the role allocation slide because before we had a, an individual slide for every single person and um, that works I think it's a little more infrastructure and maybe you guys can provide feedback or, or uh, so there's a there's a page within the working document here which is the suggestions and questions page slide seven so if you go towards the end there's a suggestions and question question page so this is questions and suggestions so these were all from last week so we can actually erase them and review them from last week's document but these are the suggestions from today and the FAQ is also this um, uh, which we can save for we can review some of these questions if we like but feel free to put put all your questions in there uh, so let's try it if this if this new way of linking work product works but for now, I'm just going to go through people's logs. Part of it is because I didn't really prepare, uh, had have enough time to, well, because we didn't have this working doc up up and about. So, okay, Richard, he's doing um, uh, recruiting work. That's good. Lashlo, deliverables. So I'm going to comment on Lashlo here. A clear date format. So, yeah, uh, I would like to request more of this kind of clear date format so people can see, like, like here... I can tell you right now, it's like, I don't know if this has been done, uh, you know, yesterday or a week before. Uh, and I can look into the, the view history tab and probably there's going to, the view history tab is going to show you that, oh, it says May 13 was the last edit, but I can't really point where that edit was. That's why I suggest in the regular log, uh, let's see, like this is who, this is Jean-Baptiste, date. And product so that it's clear okay that date I did that like here I can't really say like is this one week's work is this one month's work is it one hour's work so I can't it's hard for me to track so that's that's the suggestion here for Lashlow 
Um, but I know he did stuff, uh, but it's not transparent without him doing the stand-up right now to, as far as I'm going to ask you to do the stand-up. So I'm just going to go through everyone's log for now. So Jean-Baptiste, he's kind of disappeared. I think he's traveling or recovering. So Wednesday, the 26th of April was the last. So, okay, we won't look at that. Um, Roberto, okay. We know we got some good product here. Um, Sunday, May 14th, Axis idler side language agnostic instructional so there's a definite product awesome okay it goes to a go editable google doc which is actually not editable because i asked for permission and it wasn't so please uh, share that uh one comment on this doc these are going to be printed as paper papers pieces of paper during the workshop for those people who don't have a computer for example or uh if you don't have a computer available for a workshop because you're building this say in a workshop or by yourself or somewhere uh, I'm going to comment on the format of this. This long extended page is not really printable. So please put this in a format that can be printed with a printer, regular printer. Uh, so just simply reformatting this. But this is awesome stuff. This is FreeCAD and some manipulation using um, using Inkscape. Okay, good stuff. And I'll ask you uh, for a little more. Um, tell me... Um, yeah, let's since we're doing going through everybody's work, uh, maybe maybe let let us do that. Let let us uh, as we continue here, so we don't have to go back. Uh, Lashlo, would you mind? So Lash first, Lashlo, and then Roberto. Lashlo, would you mind going through uh, what your main main results were from last week? Because I know you did some good stuff there, and possibly like in this slide right here, paste that. Try that uh, in this slide that I'm showing. Uh, paste your main main work product if there's one thing that is main. Okay, Lashlo, go ahead, please. Yes, I can. Go ahead. So I uh, try to export a black and white picture from a pre-cat. Uh -huh. I found on the forms um, nice how to do that, and I created a video how to do this step by step. Awesome. And I also created pictures for the language diagnostic instruction for the Y and Z uh, axis, and I. Place awesome. these pictures into the um, main topic of the main wiki of the language agnostic instruction. Oh, sorry, what's the last thing? So, uh, there is a page which uh, was created to contain all the language agnostic instructionals. Yes. And I, create, I uploaded there a picture which contains my. Nice. Okay. So, picture. so what I did there. Um, I put those little notes inside your box there. Let's see if that works. Would you mind putting links to that? Um, if that works. Um, see, see if you can put the links in there if that's an effective way to do it. I know this is uh, this appears to be on your log, but let's see. Um, for example, if I look at your log, like I'm just kind of making the road by walking here. If you, if you go to Lashlow log, what you told me right now is I would not know that from looking at your log right now, unless I read through this carefully. Let's see. Like, is it like, for example, if you can answer, what is is this from what you just told me here, or that's different? Like this top here, the deliveries you say uh, on top of your log. Uh, let's see, D3 printer Y assembly video based. On yeah, that seems to be like not current. So, so let's try to make the work log super effective so date and those key links if possible uh does that make sense or is that like make no no sense to you lashlo yes it makes sense and uh, i i will put to the top and yeah and i like this kind of summary page because there is one uh, aspect that you would like to keep track of the data and also there is another aspect, uh, aspect when somebody joins and would like to review somebody's log, then it's, it's very difficult to, to review from the fragments. And yeah, so you're calling out for a, like on each each person's log, like a su good summary? Uh, I'm not calling out, just mentioning that I, I, I like to do this yeah. as well. But no, that's good. I will do what you requested and I will uh, look daily the changes. You know what? What what could probably help here, and I'm gonna put that 
on as a comment for the learnings like the slide here uh, obviously feedback questionnaire I'm gonna put here as item number three um, I'm gonna say we can easily do a like a little temp wiki based template uh, for top of for top of a person's log <clears throat> So the cool thing, I don't know if you know about this, but the wiki allows you to use templates where you can put any kind of a well-structured thing on top of a on top of a log, for example, or anywhere. <clears throat> templates can be very powerful. You can, it, it's a template that get, gets you all the formatting, and then it's easy for you to put in the critical item of information there. Maybe it's time to um, devise that, put on our backlog of tasks, which we, for that, we need somebody who knows the wiki media wiki and knows how to do templates but the, I would see that's a that's a perfect case where we standardize everybody's log because right now I'm looking at as you see everyone's log looks kind of different uh, but maybe we could come up with a standard format which, ha where, which has like the critical um, working items and then it, we can navigate each other's work better okay um, so that's cool okay Roberto I'm gonna ask you uh, for your uh, just any comments you have to add on what you What's a summary of your work? So I'm looking at uh, page six. Well, uh, allocation. If you could maybe paste it there too. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yep. If you could speak a little louder, closer to the to the mic, please. We have a. Uh, sorry, sorry. Can you speak closer to your mic? Because we're having a hard time hearing you. So bring the mic closer, or speak louder, or both. Yeah, it's. It's it's still yeah, it's, rather soft. It's, it's still rather Can you soft. talk louder? Louder. Now? Can you hear me better? That's better. Whatever you're That's doing better. there, uh, do more of that. Yeah, more of that. Okay, I, I was uh, saying that I'm using Google Drawings. Yep. Because yeah, it's easy to show my first approach to the uh, symmetric uh, views, the pre-cut files, uh, so I, I'm, I'm basically learning how to improve that that picture of the different pieces and going together. Tell me about what your discovery was what your discovery was regarding using Sorry, ink regarding yeah using ink. so regarding using yeah. inkscape so what did you learn for how to go from freecad then to inkscape what's the main learning there Yeah, this is 
um, is that is that about is that about all you have? Is that about all you have? Um, um, so I can continue. So I can continue. Yes. Um, in Inkscape, uh, finally, I I took the the, the improved image. Uh huh. to PNG, to Google Drawing. Okay, that's very good. Um, anything else to report on? Or is that about it? So I can continue on that. Okay. Okay, so, so here's the the next steps here what I'm seeing is a lot of good experiences coming about for extract I mean it took a little bit of time for us to learn the extraction of the isometric view from FreeCAD uh, using the drawing I believe we're using the drawing dimensioning workbench now here's the deal what I'm what I mentioned in the beginning of this is we're missing standard operating procedures what I'm gonna do is spend today on pulling together all the knowledge. So we have Lashlow, we've got Roberto, um, and I think we've got some Frank experience. And let's see, uh, Michael, did you gain any experience? Michael, is Michael here or no? No, Michael's not here. So those are the people that have shown, demonstrated experience on doing the language agnostic instructional process. What I'll do is I'm going to edit a tight video on how to go through all of that. So, um, but let's finish going through everybody. So, Abe, uh, go ahead with your update. Abe, um, Let's see, Abe. Abe, can you talk to us? We're not hearing you. <clears throat> or if not, we can move to the next person. Abe is working on a filament extruder, the visual bill of materials, so that we can make it work. And um, that's pretty exciting, so we can make our own filament. Uh, going next. Abe, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Abe. on the, the visual build materials for the extruder and um, let's say I did have some technical hardware difficulties this week so my log was a little bit sporadic I guess but I, I resolved those and been continuing work on that um, and, and I started reviewing the the Lyman extruder instructions and in PDF and some of his uh, instructions on how to uh, build that a little more thoroughly mm -hmm. to figure out some of the specifications on the parts and so on um, there's I guess a few things that could be changed in there maybe but I, I assume that we want to build what works first that'll be the goal and then uh, maybe prototype it differently in the future uh, but I've gotten most of the visual bomb on just the extruder done and I'm moving on to the the winder uh, this week, I think so. And I think I've gotten uh, quite a few links. It's arranged a little better now with photos and, and uh -huh. arrows to kind of diagram how uh, certain parts are in the images. And he has pretty good documentation from uh, his PDF uh, from Thingiverse, but uh, some, some parts are a little confusing. Uh, there were some things that are, well, there were some typos, I think, in the PDF. Is, and there are uh, parts that are DIY. There's actually quite a bit of, um, I don't know, probably shop work uh, for this, I'm noticing. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know. Some of that, I guess, could be prefabbed. I would say that that could be an issue. Maybe you'd have to pre-make all the parts in the workshop before you do a workshop. Yeah. Uh, noticing that, that there's quite a bit of hand shop work for some of the parts. Yeah. Uh, but... <clears throat> 
there's let's see most of the parts can just be you know it's just stuff you order or just simple uh, MDF and, and parts that are cut up sheets that are cut up scraps of uh, stuff you might even have around you know in the shop that's old that you could cut up so it is a fairly cheap uh, overall machine I think other than uh, the, you know some of the electronics the motor and stuff is the are the electronics documented how to make the whole thing run and the controls <clears throat> Let's see, run. Um, let's see, the, the electronics are kind of, uh, it's got parts that you just kind of plug and play. Yeah. The PID, I mean, there's no Arduinos or software or anything like that. It's kind of, you just put it together and I think it'll work, which is kind of nice. I mean, I could see people might want to do it with an Arduino, make it more open, but that PID, you know, just drop it in the PID and the SSR makes it fairly easy to build. So basically, you because you got to regulate temp, you got to regulate something, and the way you control this thing is just like on the controller, you just simply push buttons up and down to make it hotter or colder. Is that what basically happens? Um, yeah, I haven't read the the PID documentation in in detail. I think that that thing is fairly automatic. I assume you set it to uh, target temperatures because PID is a does calculus. I'm sure you know. Uh, to kind of target certain temperatures and uh, relative to maybe the, the speed of the machine. And yeah. it looks like he just has, you know, on-off switches for the motors and, and yeah. the heater. So, And there's different options. It looked like he had uh, a couple different versions with a fan or a voltage regulator together or not. I think he kind of decided that the fan was unnecessary in some cases. Yeah. Uh, how you want to set it up, or, or maybe it was for vertical or horizontal mounting mode too, I think. One way worked fine without it. So there might be some, some decisions to adapt the machine there uh, yeah. for yeah, most of these purposes. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's looks, good. So it's we know that the thing works for him because in the email communication with him, He's got three of these working right now, and he's just cranking out printing filament from ABS. He just bought like a you know like 500 pounds of of ABS pellets, and he's just extruding his own filament. He's got three of them mounted on a wall and just going happily at it. Uh, it's a very simple yeah. system. It appears that it has no control outside of pretty much temperature set, and then just on and off for the like. I'm curious, like the winder. You know, you have to have a good quality of the, the filament, and he's getting plus minus. 0 0.05 millimeters that's really good and he just does that with what he has shown there so let's try it I mean that's that's our first step and then um, given that we have no experience in it yet we're gonna have to see like it does his work for us or not um, so we'll see so thank you Abe that I think that's yeah. good mm -hmm. yep that's it okay um, okay so so that's a manual. He's in the background doing stuff. Jose, so Jose here. Jose's working on the website. He uh, is not here today. Uh, Cedric. Let's see. Cedric is not here, but I know Cedric did the uh, the new new extruder for the 3D printer, which we want to build the more advanced version of. So basically, the open source uh, extruder from the original Prusa i3. So that's good. Um, yeah, so that's, let's see, for example, on Thursday, he's got combined file into one video. Let's see. So he posts, so that's good. Let's see. I like looking at this, these things. So this is, for example, for his extrude, for the new extruder looks like, um, yeah, so that's good. So he's been working on that, the new extruder. That's good. Um, next. So Michael. Michael's not here. I uh, don't know what he hasn't. Uh, as far as his log, he's saying uh, his log says that he disappeared because the last time is March 29. <laughs> um, Frank, uh, Frank's been active here, so he's got um, been working on a frame. Now let's see, Frank. Uh, Frank's not here either, but he's been working a little bit on instructionals on the frame. 
so we can see what we can glean from his work. Um, okay, and Io. Now Io is not here either, but the idea with Io was he's working on a basically drawing up the simplified frame made out of PVC pipe because you can do that. Uh, so Emmanuel communicated that he's going to do a frame out of just plywood. Uh, the advantage of plywood is it's low cost, cheap, but it wouldn't really work for us here. We have a lot of humidity, and for example, my Ultimaker here, which was the the made of wood, it started to rot, <laughs> get fungus on it. So with high humidity, wood's going to have issues. Um, the original Ultimaker was wooden, so it kind of starts getting corroded after some time. PVC pipe is actually quite safe from corrosion, so that's a decent way for a, for a printer immune to environmental effects. Uh, but various simple ways to make a frame are possible, and we just then add our frames, add our motion elements to that. But that's what he's working on for a low-cost 3D printer version. Um, so that's Io. Israel. So Israel is joining us. And um, so that's it for the, uh, as far as the, the logging. So now I'm going to go, so it's 11.39. Uh, let's look at where we are on the 20.30 work assignments and progress updates. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is go over the language, what do we know about language agnostic instructionals. So last week we went over a little bit of that on slide 8. So basically doing very simple, um, simple drawings. We can extract the isometrics from FreeCAD. This was drawn by hand before. It's easier with FreeCAD. So between freehand and FreeCAD, freehand meaning you just draw it within the Google Docs like I did here, what you see. Or use extract the ISO, which is a really good way because it gets you the perfect images. An idea is to strip all the noise out of it. Just strip everything outside of the needed parts. And you can look at, um, if you Google IKEA diagrams, you can see what we're talking about. And um, I think that's on the, the protocol page on the wiki, I think has, has a sample. It's actually, the page is called IKEA Style Fabrication Diagram. And um, we show this, uh, but the links, yeah, there you go. Uh, so that's some work here. This is, I believe, Lashno, I guess. Um, so this is just the general protocol page. So the specific page for the D3D printer should be on a separate page because this is just the protocol page. But if you look at um, Google IKEA style fabrication, IKEA diagrams, from IKEA Furniture, you'll see what this is about. We basically strip down all the excess info. So read through this, but now the next next thing. So the things, um, just continuing this, um, standard operating procedure. So one, follow the script, lay out the procedure in your presentation, and use a cover page. So use the instructionals cover page, which we've used before. So when you start a document, we have this nice attractive cover page. So you can use that. Um, and then hyperlink to your log. Um, or at the role allocation page slide, which is the slide number six here with a document link. So if you're working on this currently, like on slide six, we're going through what everyone is working on, you can link, link that to that. Um, and then fit as much information per page without overloading the page. So remember that this is gonna be printed in a printed document, so make it format such that it can be printed on a 3D printer. Then put a link to your working script in your document, so your source, the, the working script is your source, and then put a link to the isometric source files from FreeCAD in your document as well, so that someone who can look at your document can edit it by looking at the script and looking at your, your FreeCAD files, and they could just extract things from there. Um, and now we're hearing that the other piece of source is your Inkscape files. Also, uh, upload your Inkscape files and link to them. Now what I'll do is, as, as we see, this is a missing procedure. Like We need a nice, tight procedure to show a good working example of this so we can get some really nice product here. And this is, this is pretty good stuff. I mean... There's very few people who end up doing the language agnostic instructional step, but for us it's critical because we want to uh, make the workshop experience totally replicable, that you can literally have a whole workshop full of people. The goal, like the metric of success is really uh, kill the instructor. 
if the instructor disappears, what happens? Can the people actually have enough information? Is the documentation good enough that everyone can actually go through the complete build, even if the instructor is not there? That, to me, would be the single most profound metric of success of how well we did the documentation. So think about that. Okay, so that's on the language agnostic instructions. And as I said, I'm going to work on... Um, doing an instruct a tight instructional for that this is part of our curriculum development and maybe I could actually get get uh, inspired to put out a video calling out for curriculum developers because this is really curriculum development teaching ourselves how to do the language agnostic instructionals okay uh, with that said let's talk about the next uh, priorities and where we are for role allocation so we're a number of people are working on a language agnostic instructionals uh, Abe's working on a filament maker and um, the one thing that we want to start on is the CNC torch table. I know Chaz is, is working on, an, on the uh, electronics. Chaz, do you want to pipe in to, to the discussion today where you're at on that, or is that okay? So far, um, the parts. Yeah, so Chaz is prototyping um, the actual higher power electronics using the same electronics that we used before. I just started, do we know? Yep. Um, the ramps. Ramps controller for the 3D and, printer. And um, the 600 micro step driver. The five motors. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, 6600. Yeah, that's it. And then the power supply. And right now it looks like I'll probably have to buy like just some wires, some yeah. wiring to power the power supply. I gotta figure out the doc or find some documentation on how to wire the microcontroller ramps and TB6600 together. So like um, like you said, we discussed via email, you want me to wire some of the electronic parts together. Yeah. So I'm going to need to <clears throat> have some documents yeah. to figure out um, what gets plugged into where. And then also, at some point, I'll probably have to program the Arduino unless there's a source code, source code that's available already. Yeah, for the Arduino, we can use the same control code as before. Uh, so basically, the, the the Marlin that we're using on a 3D printer, you, you can just use that with Cura, the control 3D printer control interface, and you can make hit a, a key on the Cura platform to move the axis back and forth. So that the same software that we're using, you can use as is to do the testing. But basically, the idea here is instead of using the tiny ramps, the tiny controller for the 3D printer, we're using that same controller, but we're using external motor drivers, which is now this much more beefy motor driver that can run many, many motors. So for example, if we want to do a torch table, which is I'll get to next, um, we can run multiple motors. Like for example, if we want to put a, two motors per side using our even our tiny NEMA 17 motors, we can do two per side and it's got say on a Y axis, you got two Y axes, you got two motors per side, so you got four motors. That means instead of running one motor on a Y or two motors on a Y like we do with a current 3D printer, we can run four or more, however many we need to get the extra power for the larger machine. So that's the general idea, be being able to run much higher power stepper motors or more of them using the same controller by simply adding an external stepper driver to the identical same electronics. So that's good. Um, Chaz, uh, are you clear cut as far as what you got to do on that? For uh, next, or yeah, to um, find the wi wiring like, is uh, the. Some... I guess wiring is if the biggest. Just like uh, link me some of the documentation. Yeah. For the wiring. Okay. Yeah. For, um, just yeah. Like some material to reference. Yep. So for example, so I can tell you that you can actually pull that up, and I'll teach you how right now. So you got the D3D page. And on the D3, so that's our working page. So it's an exercise in collaborative literacy here. D3D page, we gotta have uh, modules. So there's modules, item number nine, and then we go to hardware and controls, and then there is the D3D controller and D3D Marlin. Those two links give us a lot of insight, pretty much complete documentation of what we have so far on using Marlin, which is the software, and the controller, which is the wiring and stuff. So those two pages, Chaz, start with that and see if what you need there uh, is there. So you can, for example, on a D3D Marlin page, you can download the Marlin as is right there and upload it to your Arduino. So that's good there. And then on a the controller page, the other page, 
we've got um, let's see how much we have on um, electronics but there's some wiring like yeah there's a decent there's there's a bit of information on the wiring uh, on those two documents see what's missing and maybe fill that in but that's a good start right there so here we talk about the basically you have to plug up wire up this board to the stepper motors it's essentially this control board you got power going to it and stuff but these four wires here we have five actually for five different steppers but plug in just the, the X and that's it and then you can control one of your axes only trick is that the board as is it it, it needs to have a thermistor like it needs to know that uh, the temperature on the extruder is okay so actually the only trick to that is you have to like short circuit the thermistor connection which is right there um, I'm showing it it's actually like that white white thing with my pointer there that's the thermistor connection you just have to put wires in between that to show that that's closed anyway uh, this this explains it so you can get a lot of that info from the wiring so if you have any more questions please email me but that's um, that's where it's at D3D and then D3D modules and then the controller so there that is okay so uh, talking about the CNC torch one inch axis so uh, I want to talk about scalability and then let's see how we can allocate roles so on the scalability uh, Lashlow you asked about how you know how do you scale the little 3d printer to a larger machine well here's the idea the idea is that the electronics you can use the exact same electronics controller but use larger stepper motor drivers which Chaz is working on and that new stepper driver is eight dollars instead of like two dollars or something uh, per axis so that's the way to get the control now the mechanical the mechanical means you can still use the same motors which are the tiny NEMA 17s and that's what we're gonna do for now we might actually go to NEMA 23 which are slightly larger but we can do either we can do NEMA 17 or NEMA 23 those are size of stepper motors now for for replicability like to show the build you know building upon prior work model we can use the very tiny NEMA 17s even on a torch table because each one of those has like 15 pounds of drive force which is enough like if you put four of them on the X on the Y Y axis you got like uh, like 16 times 4 like 60 pounds of drive force that's way more than enough to drive uh, a non-contact torch head for the CNC torch table so that's that but you're gonna need bigger rods you can't go get away with the eight millimeter slash five sixteenths inch rods you're gonna need bigger rods so we, we are gonna so the next step in the game is to go to the bigger machines we need to make the larger 3d printed pieces which we actually already have we did that last year and we can uh, fit in the missing pieces from that uh, so we use the larger 3d printed pieces and one inch threaded rod, one inch, sorry, one inch, um, the thread, one inch rods, the smooth rods. And then the belt could actually be the same. You can still use the same belt. Uh, that belt is um, good enough for how much force we need for the torch table. So most same parts. And then you need a bigger frame. Uh, you need to mount this somewhere. But the next step on a CNC torch is actually to draw up the universal axis details in the one inch form and this is what I'd actually like to talk about to uh, maybe Cassie and to Israel maybe you guys can pair up and I can guide you through where those files are for the one inch and starting to do the universal axis remake in one inch so we haven't done any of that we do have the 3d printed pieces the CAD for that from last year but beyond that now we're gonna have to assemble the whole axis assembly using the one inch much larger uh, rod size so I'll follow up with you on that I won't talk too much about that right now I can go offline once we allocate other roles um, but what I'll do after this meeting is simply email you with what the problem statement is so basically use larger 3d printed pieces now the electronics Chaz is working on so the same controller just bigger drivers and longer wires that's it I mean really that's it, it the, conceptually it's beautiful it's simple um, and then use one inch rods 
everything else is just about the same and of course larger frame so we'll have to uh, do a larger frame but one way to do a larger frame is to take four of the 16 inch frames and use those as corner pieces to hang the much larger one inch axis so actually this is not a larger frame just use four of the 16 inch d3d frames to mount your axis upon so that that you have you, you just need a hanging point to mount the axis um, d3d printers now okay but the ma magnets sorry we can't do that anymore the magnets are good for the 3d printer in this case we're gonna have to use the existing bolt holes that are within the carriage the 3d printed pieces to attach them more firmly to um, the frame so so no magnets we move to bolts now but that's okay because you still use the identical parts you're just using bolts to go, to go through the frame that means the frame will have to have a few holes in it so each frame piece wherever you attach an axis would have two two bolt holes minimum on each side so it's like four bolt holes per frame piece which are not currently in a, in a CAD. So we might actually want to add that um, to the CAD. So I would say add this to the CAD uh, frame, but that's kind of beyond the scope. We'll work on the larger, um, the basic universal axis. Um, we're talking about now five by 10 feet. This is large, much larger, uh, five feet by 10 feet, about two by three meters. In size this is a full-scale machine that gets us parts for the tractors brick presses everything else and like Abe ta talked about some of the parts for, say for the filament extruder he said there was a few fabricated parts I saw some of those parts they can be CNC torch cut so CNC torch cutting is a very powerful industrial tool uh, but it will get you you guys going on that uh, but that's the basic problem statement uh, reformulate the current universal axis into the one inch rod form so and make you know let's do uh the x-axis first which is five feet the y-axis is going to be 10 feet and then there's going to be a z-axis which is only a few inches that you just need to move the torch up and down just a little bit so that's that's what that is and also there's a in the background we also have another project going d3d circuit mill that shane is working with. Well, i won't talk about that but the only thing to say about that is using the same frame, the metal frame from the D3D 16 inch version, 3D printer 6, 16 inch version, we can use that same frame and put a spindle on that to make a small circuit mill. So that's some really good work that's going to get happen uh, June 18 when, when, um, when Shane is going to come for a little dedicated project visit of two weeks to factory farm here to work on that. Um, okay, but now I'm going to go... Um, so that's that's a bit of an answer to Lashlow's question. How do we go to the larger scale things? And you have to kind of go through the whole design and say, okay, well, can I use the identical thing wherever possible? Yes, use that. Use the same belts. Use the same motors. Use the same controller. Use the same same 16-inch frame, pe frame uh, idea. So basically uh, along the construction set approach. Okay, uh, next. Uh, let's go through the role allocation and see what people have. So I know that my role here is going to be, um, I want to really work on that instructional for the language agnostic inst instructional so that we're really producing some very impressive work like it's already starting to come about. Um, Ahmed, he's kind of disappeared. Abe, Abe, you've got plenty of work appears on the filament extruder. Io, we'll have to follow up with him. Jose, we have to follow up. Chaz, it looks like he's going. Michael will have to follow up with them. Uh, Frank will have to. Cedric. Uh, Roberto and Lashlo, Jean Baptiste. Um, and did I miss anyone else from the meeting today? Cassie and, and Israel will get you going so we can follow up on that and we'll communicate on a 3D printer. So look at this. You, uh, in a welcome email, you have the link to the, D, uh, the Open Source Ecology Network which is the technical discussions go there. Put um, Communicate publicly there. So what I'll do is I'll actually write the email, but I'll post it on the network, 
and just let you know that I post it on a network so everyone can see the discussion. So put all the discussion. Don't email me. The etiquette is upload files to the wiki and send links to them and send links to uh, don't send emails. Send links to what you posted on a, on a public development page. That's the way we want to roll. Okay, so Lashlo. Um, oh, this IO joined us. Oh, IO's just on. Uh, what's happening there? IO's joining in a document there. How to join in? Uh, why wasn't that in your uh, welcome email? Yeah. Um, but that's the. Let's send IO the. Yeah, that's the Hangout, so I'll just do that. Uh, there's the link. Okay, that's the Hangout. Um, let's see, so with Lashlo and Roberto, I think you guys are working, but um, let's see, what's a good thing you can work on? Definitely you can continue on what you're doing. You've got the scripts, uh, Lashlo, um, do you have next steps that you're working on or do you need more direction? Uh, I think yes, I have uh, next steps. Okay. I would like to... Go ahead. Okay, so, so we, we can discuss the next steps next weekend. Probably I will have some... Okay. Yeah, so post to... Feel free to post to the network as far as your status and everything else. So uh, as far as questions, so I think this is, um, and Roberta, are you okay for now? It seems like you're moving forward as well in the language agnostic instructionals. Okay. 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 That sounds good. Roberta's good to go. Okay. Um, that sounds good. And um, let's see what else. So, and as far as the meeting agenda goes, we just got the. Um, it's pretty much on a teamwork assignments. Let's continue all the questions and discussions on the development network and I'll send out follow-up email so that everybody has each other's email where I'm including Israel and Cassie onto the email thread because there is that email thread we're also keeping but for now let's go to the questions and suggestions page so does anyone have any questions and any suggestions well obviously everything is crystal clear here because there is no questions <laughs> um, so that's great, people. <laughs> now, I'm sure there's plenty of questions, so maybe you can write them um, afterwards or ask away on the 3D printer development group. Okay. Uh, what else to talk about? To review, I'll, I'll just sum up here. We're at, at noon time, so just about end time for our meeting. Um, people, I would say, yeah, this is going pretty good. I mean... Um, uh, as normal, uh, just as far as the overall review, so so make sure you do the feedback questionnaire. But the overall review is, I mean, it's pretty good. We're, my response to this is that, yeah, it's a wild, hairy process. We're making the road by walking and uh, definitely missing the aspect of curriculum or uh, protocols or instructionals on how to do the stuff that we do. So standard operating procedures, how do we do one step or another? So that's a big call out for producing curriculum, getting people on the team that can focus on documentary role, documenting the processes. And I'm going to step in to do the instructional on the language agnostic instructionals, which I think is a very important piece of the puzzle. Just like we pretty much cracked the, um, the exploded part animations. But for a new person doing the exploded part animations, for example, we don't really have a great video summarizing that whole process. We've got excellent product, but 
that kind of a project would lend itself to somebody joining the curriculum development, looking at what all the people have done, asking questions to how everyone did everything and what were the things that worked and tricky things and, and easy things. So we can do a nice tight edited video on the Explorer part animations and now on the language agnostic instructional. So I think we're going forward. It's pretty good. Um, but um, for me, just a general uh, feedback is, yeah, we're definitely short on As we get more and more people, it's harder to train everybody up. As you know, every week, maybe a new person comes in. That person has to get up to speed as soon as possible. And I understand that's a challenge and we got to work that out. But that's just more documentation, more standard procedures to be documented with good good videos and that's all I can say about that and I wish the recruiting function would uh, provide more of those people it's we're kind of slow on the recruiting thing um, we still haven't really figured out a good workflow how to get more people but we can only ask you guys to uh, maybe um, you know ask friends and see if we can get your friends interested in this as well <clears throat> and I'm, I'm constantly recruiting new people and interviewing um, and I would say overall like I you know um, you know, this is hard work. We're press, you know, pressing the boundaries of collaborative development. Um, bear with it. I think uh, we're really kind of like the guinea pigs here, and sometimes it might get might get depressing. That you know, are we making progress? But then, and then again, we come up with um, you know stuff like Roberto. I get all depressed, and then I see that kind of stuff. And I say, oh, this is great, just beautiful. We're making progress. <laughs> so. Uh, keeping the morale high because we're we are doing some very good work with respect to this all being open source workflows that is a beautiful part that means uh, a lot a lot of people can join this process and uh, in retrospect um, so I did the TED talk in 2011 it's been five years since then I wish I started the teams at that time we didn't we basically had all this ad hoc development where people just pop popped up and they said yeah yeah I'm so excited to help but the thing that was missing there was the idea that we didn't have a team, like a team structure. So now we're definitely working on that. But I wish, you know, in retrospect, of course, hindsight is, tw hindsight is 2020, as they say, um, definitely should have started on the very dedicated team a long time ago. But it took a lot of learning to understand that that's even possible. The first breakthrough right there was learning just about a year ago. It was like one or two years ago now that that is even possible that people will work in a dedicated way on a dedicated team as volunteers like when you think about that how do you do that how do you motivate people to do it well it's possible so we know it's possible and we're doing that so we've cracked that barrier and now the question is how do we actually scale the you know, the entrepreneurial activity where people are getting livelihoods from this people who are uh, developing products to, to a good enough state that they're sold as products, as workshop offerings, uh, to the point of an open source micro factory that could be a standard product, to the point that the Seed Eco Home can be a standard product that we can roll out in a workshop. You know, have a bunch of people show up, in five days you build a house. Or have a bunch of people show up, and one day you build a 3D printer or a tractor. I mean, that's it's a very attractive enterprise model. I think definitely as people get more skilled and automation robotics and all this comes in information access is unbridled uh, the, the possibility of people making their own stuff is an absolute inevitable reality and I think we're, we're treading the the foreground I mean basically paving the way on that so this is exciting keep doing the good work and the real real deal for this starting to really really scale is a few few projects that really take off like you know, the 3D printer, whatever it is, the house, the open source micro factory, maybe the torch table. We're just going the, with the simplest, lowest hanging fruit right now, which is the 3D printer, because it's a well understood, very popular device as a way to get everybody involved, as opposed to making the much larger machines like the tractors, which are much larger uh, entry barriers. So we're making the road by walking. Um, anyway, um, keep going, people. We, we're working on the the 3d printer the torch table the the extruder uh, progress is happening so thank you if you have any questions just email or go to the development network and I'll follow up with the new people on exactly what to do or you can ask me more what to do on that um, or maybe Io uh, since you actually joined us here 
any quick last words on an update of where you are and do you need more direction? You got to unmute yourself though. <clears throat> So um, I think the, the main challenge I've had with doing that um, D3D alternative frame has been yeah. um, getting Spreaker to work for me. So um, I'm approaching I'm approaching it like I'm new to Spreaker, so I'm going to spend a lot more time like working on the of the Spreaker and all that, um, so that I, I can like iterate through um, any work process I need to do with it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, good point. So, so that kind of gets us to the point that there's three main instructionals we need to do. Like, there, there's a the thing we haven't done right now is to perfect the library for the D3D 3D printer. What that means that there's several different levels of manipulating those fi files. One is the absolute complete detailed files others could be less detailed much lighter files but altogether we have to organize around several levels one is the part files one is the module files and overall assembly files which uh, the workflow can be greatly optimized and one of the other things we haven't checked for is actual validation of how each of those parts were made so we have to actually go back there and clean up the and literally uh, go through each file and the sequence of how each part was made to make sure that the the parts are created according to best practice including things like setting proper constraints or uh, having a certain kind of a procedural workflow where there's a pattern of how you actually create an object using best practices because I know people you can design an object in many different pathways like you can go to create one object that many many different ways can get you there you can do one part first then another that order could be changed upside down so we need to have now this really kind of makes me go back to the documenter role we need somebody to and that that takes time that will take time to actually go through how every uh one of the files that we already have has been made to approve it to actually say okay this is according to best practice so it won't crash it'll be fast and smooth as anything and I think the ultimate test of that would be that any novice can take, say there's a folder of part files and within like an hour or half an hour compose an entire D3D printer. You guys all have experience with the, the cubic frame of, that you did for the FreeCAD test. That's pretty much the level we want to get to for the entire printer. There's only 40 parts, 40 unique parts, well many more uh, parts than that, but 40 unique parts and so forth. But designed properly and at the proper level of detail you can pull down like say the entire axes and create a complete perfected um, file that won't crash that you can get the the exploit part animations out of it without crashing 
or the language agnostic instructionals without problem. That has to be standardized. And I think uh, since you're expecting um, a better, better, a better deal from from FreeCAD IO, um, yeah, we can work on that to make sure that everyone's following the best practices because it, it is workable, but it needs more teaching of people how to do that. So I'm observing that the the overall uh, part library for D3D needs a major instructional. How do you actually create all those files and how do you work with them effectively? So that the newcomers right now, like, like Cassie and Israel, you can totally just jump right in and without spending a lot of time be very effective. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, instructional on the, on the language agnostic instructionals and the instructional on the <clears throat> exploded part animations, which are some of the major milestones we're achieving so far. So, man, the, the real question is here. We need to spend some time documenting and, and um, try to find more people for the team to do that. In the meantime, what I'll do is I'll, I'll work on the language agnostic instructional documentation. And yeah, we're absolutely missing stuff on um, on the cleaning up all of the the free cat for d3d that we already have that's like a that's a kind of like a bigger project that the new people shouldn't really have to go through so i apologize for that in advance here but we just need um that to be documented more and maybe you know maybe what i could do is uh, the people who the other people who haven't shown up to this meeting i'll maybe try to get them on doing some of that documentation work and creating standards by which we say okay these are all the checkpoints that a file must have in order to be a fully accepted file for the part library like if you go to the d3d part library or part library in general page there's files that have already have the checks that have been printed and made uh, so they're approved for actual build of the parts, but maybe they're actually not good enough because they crash. They actually have some defects. They might be good enough for actually generating an STL file and ma making a good 3D printout of it. But underneath it, we actually don't know if they're actually fully approved. So we have to go through that process. So we have to kind of go back to that. And now as new people are coming on, yeah, we kind of owe you that to, for that all to be ready. So we're kind of getting backlogged on the documentation. Um, not really allowing the new people to come in and learn as fast as they could so kind of bear with us as we get this worked out or possibly maybe get involved in it maybe i don't know maybe i or maybe you can we can get you going on that if that's interesting to you to actually look at the files how they were made and to clean them up because i think we can define a very clear procedure where we might actually have to start every part from scratch because they weren't made according to the specific procedures but the good part is that once you have a single you know a part there's 40 items all together so it's only 40 items that's really good from that you can create everything else but we got to make sure that at the very beginning those 40 parts have been constructed perfectly that's a start so maybe what we should do um well definitely we need to do that is approve every single part that it's according to best practice and therefore the best practice has to be uh, written up uh, and there's some documentation on best practices from FreeCAD and for OSC we may have some other additional best practices so there's a bit of work to do on documentation so the only thing for me I can say it's like okay this makes me say I'm, I'm gonna get out there and make a video saying hey call out for documenters we need people to now clean up pick up document what we have done because it's not you know it's not good enough now that we're scaling to more and more people uh, we might have to do a little bit more work on it and maybe um you know, it's actually a, perhaps a good case for Cassie and Israel because you kind of have that little bit of a learning curve to go on. Maybe the new people, you know, a good idea would be to actually get you all on uh, doing some of that documentation work, at least getting familiar with, uh, with that. So maybe uh, as you, yeah, I mean, we still want to do the CNC torch table one inch version, but maybe we start that process, process by saying, okay, we start with this cleaned up file and then we move on to the one inch version, like by scaling it up or using the files that we already have uh, using those. So so let's add that discussion of, of cleaning up documentation to the new people's uh, workflow. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Cassie. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, we really need to go back. Yeah, now that we've got new people, we're really, because see, because the, the idea here is on the scalable 3D printer construction set, you have one set of files, you can build any kind of machine. Now we haven't shown it. We haven't shown a case where 
somebody in like half an hour designs a complete printer. That we haven't done yet. That means our files are not good enough. They may be too messy, too heavy. Um, they might not have the right level of abstraction. What do I mean by level of abstraction? That means that once you go to a complete machine, you need to not use the fully detailed files. Like, for example, screws. You can't use the threads on all the screws. That would make the machine into like a gig gigabyte of memory if you included all the threads on the hundreds hundred screws, right? It would, the, the threads weigh a lot. They take a lot of memory. So we have to ha have the correct level of abstraction everywhere. Uh, and I think the, the metric would be, okay, anyone can now take download the files that we have for the existing 3d printer and literally we we should be able to teach a novice in like an hour of dedicated instructional time or a couple of hours how to design their own 3d printer uh, if they know how the parts go together so so just the manipulation part like for us that we have done it we should be able to put an entire printer together really fast and we're not there yet that means we still have to do the work on optimizing the actual design process, design procedures. So one product that comes out of that is the the guide, the the guide, the three D printer construction set manual. How do you actually design the the printer, and how do you use FreeCAD to effectively work with the files that we have, and which files do you want to use where? So that's like a whole course there. But yeah, definitely lots of documentation. I'll get, I'll so I'll I'll talk more about that to the new people. Um, we'll get going on that so we can actually start cleaning up the old files and that's going to be easier for everybody because like for example what IO you mentioned I think what you mentioned is a totally tractable problem you're saying that FreeCAD is just hard it's hard to work with in a professional way well the thing is we have to learn a different way to approach it a little bit but I believe that from what I've seen of FreeCAD so far there is not a disadvantage to it like if you use it properly you can get really fast and really good at it. And I think actually Emmanuel is qu right now quite good and fast at it. He, he just cranks out things in minutes right now. Um, but that's the level we, we all want to all get to as the team. And I think it's quite possible. So the encouragement is there. Yeah, it, it should be doable as long as you, you kind of invest a little bit of time to know what to do within FreeCAD and that we can document. Uh, the, the certain ways to operate within FreeCAD that, that prevents crashes, that is super fast, that's reliable and, and just 100% foolproof. And I, I think we can get there. And for the things that are not there, that's where we go to then the programmers and say, okay, there's this known bug that does this and, and join the, the FreeCAD developer, developer team to actually clean that up within the FreeCAD source code. So that's a call out for, for developers who are programmers and we can start recruiting for those kinds of people. So that's that's what we want to do here. But for now, I think I'll quit at this. We ran a little bit over time, but welcome to the new people. Uh, let's continue the discussion on um, on the network. And um, what I'll do is I'll start cleaning up the... Uh, I'm going to go start looking at all the files we have so far for, for the D3D, because as we need to go to the one-inch version, we need to make sure that that's all uh, clean and, and the ways of how we design it. There's at least a basic... Uh, clear-cut instruction for how to take all the files and work with them because right now it's kind of scattered over the wiki so it's a great case for documentation so we we definitely need to spend some time on that I think with that said um, I think that's about it any maybe last-minute questions let's see if any questions popped up on um, on um, slide number 11 no everything seems to be absolutely clear still okay excellent well <laughs> Next. Next page. Oh, next page. Process improvement. Review general immediate timeline and meetings so everyone knows priorities and we can identify what might be taking too long so we can reprioritize as needed. Priority details help focus and prevent time wasted on minor issues and maybe we can move towards doing a burn down eventually. Who said that? That's pretty good. Um, that's good. So the, the Abe, Abe, that's good. Uh, so in the um, so in the team agenda, I'm going to try to be better and post. As soon as this meeting is done, I'm going to make a copy of this team agenda for the, I'm sorry, that's May 15 there, uh, for the May 22nd meeting. And then uh, please review the agenda before the meeting and keep me to task on, on uh, sticking to the agenda. So that will be one way to do that. Um, and what else? That's good. Uh, besides that, I think that's about it for now. Um, we'll follow up uh, over the over the internet on a discussion group thank you for participating and um
we'll continue from there. Um, closing the discussion here. Please uh, continue all the discussions on the network and email. So thank you. And uh, great job, everyone. I think this is moving forward. It's a little tricky, but yeah, we really see the big case for documentation, just better documentation as we keep building the team because that's going to be critical. Um, I'm going to shut off here. Thank you.